Go the French uh, Financial and Business Daily. I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you today for this panel discussion in, around uh, nuclear energy hosted by uh, MHI. Uh, I will introduce uh, all of the, the, the panelists pretty soon. The idea is to really have a, a, a general discussion about the, the, the future of uh, electricity. Uh, we all know that we will need electricity in the future, but what kind of electricity? Uh, is nuclear really part of the answer? Yes, I think most in this room will say yes. But what kind of nuclear? At what cost? With what kind of uh, regulation? There are many questions. We will have many of the answers uh, today. And the idea is to have a, a lively discussion on those, uh, on those uh, subjects. Um, first, Mr. Miyanaga, who is the, the CEO of uh, MHI, he has been the CEO of MHI since uh, 2013. He joined MHI in uh, 1972. I was a correspondent in Japan, and uh, in Japan, MHI stands for industry. Everybody knows the, the, the three diamonds. It's uh, one of the biggest conglomerates. It's involved in everything that is made by machines. It's, uh, it's an institution in, 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 in Japan. It's involved in steel, and Mr. Miyanaga has uh, worked in the steel industry for for a long time in machinery, in defense, in aerospace, in power system. Uh, it's one of the oldest and most prestigious company in, in Japan. It employs around 80,000 people, and it has around uh, $38 billion worth of, of uh, revenues per year. Uh, to launch the discussion, Mr. Miyanagas, would you make a, a, a short presentation of around the 10 minutes to introduce the debate, and then we'll have the, the panel discussion, and I will introduce uh, the other panelists after that. Mr. Miyanagas, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Baru. The, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the, I am pleased to welcome you today to our panel discussion on the possibility of coexistence of nuclear and other energy resources. This is indeed a, comp a complex task, but necessary for the success of energy transition. We can say that energy transition is about decarbonization, decarbonization and fossil fuel substitution, and that progressive electrification of the economy is the way forward, and that renewables and nuclear will be the two pillars to support this electrification in a robust and cost-efficient way. Now, I'd like to present in a few words MHI, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries' specific, specific views on this key issue. The, yes, okay. This first uh, point to consider is the debate on the energy transition should not be limited to the question of the place of renewables in the electri electricity mix in connection with other technologies, but should rather focus on the progressive substitution of fuel, uh, fossil fuels by low carbon energy sources in the global e energy mix. In most cases, renewables are considered as the stepping stone of the energy transition, and their development is often considered in a, in a context of competition with the other electricity generation uh, the technologies, including nuclear. As a matter of fact, most countries are witnessing a strong growth of renewables in their electricity mi mix Support, uh, supported by a uh, development of a framework of renewables that has been designed to increase their share in the electricity mix by giving them the levers to be competitive against the other technologies, including nuclear. Many different regulatory and pricing schemes have been put in place with the same goal, such as regulatory and pri uh, 
pricing, regulatory and pr uh, pricing policies in favor of renewables, quotas and obligations, uh, feed-in tariffs and premiums, fixed price auctions, net metering, uh, billing, and so on. Renewables uh, investments increase by tax credit, credit and subsidies and so on, but the side effect of renewables development is also to reduce the competitiveness of other technologies and to challenge their own development. Renewables, uh, zero marginal cost, give them priority on market merit order and has for consequence the decrease of the other technologies' load factors. Renewables increase in the mix leads to overcapacities in many or mature markets and therefore to lower electricity wholesale price, putting other technologies' uh, profitability at risk. However, to some extent, the, ex uh, the experts' debate misses the true objective of, of energy transition. What is, to, what is at stake is not only the, the electricity mix and the place of renewables in it, but most importantly, the progressive substitution of fossil fuels in the global energy mix. And this is a much more challenging target. Indeed, many countries are focusing renewables development on substituting one electricity generation technology by other or another, whereas the real target is the development of low carbon electricity to substitute fossil fuel and decarbonate the total energy mix. It is important to bear in mind that electricity amounts for only a small share of total energy consumption. For example, in Japan, total primary energy consumption is five times more, import, uh, uh, more important than electricity consumption. And in the United Kingdom and Germany, I think that is six times or more. Besides, electricity is often already partly, uh, partly decarbonized thanks to hydropower, nuclear. It is, in fact, the fossil fuels used in industries, mobility, residential heating, that count for the lion's share in the energy mix and that are the main threat to energy transition. Therefore, MHI, we believe that energy transition is facing two key challenges, the electrification of the economy and the substitution of fossil fuels by low carbon electricity generation technologies allowed by both nuclear and renewables. Let's talk about the first challenge of energy transition, the need to take all necessary actions in, in favor of the gen uh, greenification and electrification of all end applications to decrease dependency to fossil fuel. For most end, for most end sectors, the low carbon tec uh, technical solutions and end applications exist or are in development. For example, New nuclear plants in development, such as Generation Plus, the 3 Plus, Generation 4, electric mobi mobility, hydrogen electri electrified, uh, hydrogen electrified applications, and so on. It is critical to favor the development of these electrifi electrified and low carbon technologies. The second, the second challenge of energy transition is to fully leverage nuclear and renewables 
as the two pillars of low carbon electricity mix to support energy transition by substituting fossil fuels. In this res respect, to support the progressive electrification of the economy, nuclear appears to be the necessary second leg of energy transition, sharing key advantages with renewables. This is that. Uh, this is the contribution to zero carbon, indeed the zero carbon footprint, contribution to energy independency. Actually, main, uh, many countries with strong decarbonation, uh, decarbonation objectives with nuclear and renewables, such as United Kingdom and China, have already succeeded to reduce carbon dioxide sub emissions whereas the countries that have failed to promote nuclear in this objective, such as Japan and Germany, have failed to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions at this moment. As a result, the necessary complement, uh, complementarity of nuclear and renewables for low carbon future should be acknowledged and their spe specific contributions should also be recognized. Recognized, that is, nuclear is the ideal partner of renewables towards a global and optimized, optimized low carbon energy mix as it brings high reliability base load with limited space use and plays a strong part in system balancing services. For this reason, the system impacts of rap uh, rapid renewables development should be uh, reviewed and uh, counterbalanced, such as impacts on price impacts on balancing requirements, generating an increase in total system costs, potential impacts on carbon dioxide emissions, probably increase in peaking power plant output. For example, in Germany, since 2010, and the increase of renewables plus decrease of nuclear in the mix, the load factor of other generation technologies such as gas power plants has been divided by two and the number of hours with negative electricity prices on the wholesale market has been mul uh, multiplied by 14. The consequences have been very negative on the business cases of balanced uh, base road assets such as nuclear. In that perspective, some nuclear regulatory policies and technological innovations are needed to set up a new framework to ensure a complementary development of both renewables and nuclear in harmony in a robust low carbon system. This objective requires to ensure positive conditions for nuclear development and create a sustainable framework for a robust and the integrated electricity system based on nuclear and renewables. First, new statutory frameworks are needed to develop solid business cases for capital intensive assets such as nuclear and therefore compensate the negative impacts of an electricity mix with high renewable share and its inter intermittency. Possible levers includes capacity payments, long-term and fixed price contract, obligation for op uh, operators to feed stable hourly hands of capacity into the grid, allocation of grid connection and extension costs to generators, and so on. Current support uh, mechanisms for renewable energies should also uh, consequently be re reviewed. For instance, 
by favoring carbon tax and feed-in uh, premiums over feed-in tariffs. Additionally, additionally, it will be necessary to encourage technological innovations and invest in new energy infrastructures to achieve a scalable and harmonized co-development in a uh, context of a uh, context of in a context of increased electric generation uh, decentralization and uh, intermittency and other scientific approaches for example development of energy flexibilities locally and globally with short-term and long-term storage solutions transmission grid expansion, nuclear flexibility implementation through existing uh, nuclear power plants uh, output adjustment, and development of new flexible technologies such as small modular reactors, use of flexible, flexible gas uh, power plant, uh, for example, the gas turbine combined cycle uh, advanced type, use of rising technology like artificial intelligence and IoT, uh, Internet of Things, to smartly integrate, it, integrate these new assets into the system and ensure demand supply adjustment. In conclusion, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Group commi are committed to deliver state-of-the-art technologies in nuclear, renewables, and clean gas elect electricity to achieve the energy transition goal as, as smoothly as possible. Although nuclear has been facing inten uh, intense economic pressure, MHI is strongly convinced of the importance of nuclear power and maintaining and improving the technology as much more efficient and safer one. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miyanaga. Let me introduce the different uh, panelists of today. Just uh, sitting on the left of Mr. Miyanaga is Mr. Xavier Ursa, who is the Senior Executive VP Group of uh, EDF since March uh, 2015. He's in charge of engineering and uh, new nuclear project and he has been at EDF since 1991 and it would be good also to um, uh, say that he is now at the board of uh, Framatom. Uh, on his left is uh, Tom uh, Gretrex who is the, um, executive of, uh, the chief executive of the uh, Nuclear Industry Association uh, of the United Kingdom. He has been in this position since 2016. For the five previous years he was a member of parliament uh, he was in the opposition and he was the shadow minister in the UK Parliament in charge of uh, energy questions. And so um, he is today the lead spokesman in the UK on uh, nuclear energy, but he has been involved in uh, nuclear energy for, for several years and it will be interesting to have his point of view. And to his left is uh, Dr. Kepler, who is an economist. He's a professor of economy at uh, Paris Dauphine and um, he directs the chair on European electricity market. He is also a senior advisor at the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency, and he has been working a lot on the competitiveness of uh, low uh, carbon uh, technology. The, the questions that we need to answer today, I think, is, uh, is not do we need nuclear energy. Most of the people in this room and on this panel, I'm pretty sure, uh, agree. There is a debate sometimes outside, uh, but the question is uh, how can we have nuclear energy in the mix? Before we try to answer how we can have an efficient, a cost-effective, uh, a safe nuclear energy, maybe on this question on why we do need nuclear energy, it would be interesting to have the point of view of three people with three different backgrounds. Uh, one who is an energy producer, one who is uh, defending the nuclear energy but who used to be a, a politician, and one who is a, an economist. So basically my first question to the three of you is when you look at the electricity mix in the past, today and in the future, why do you really need, do you really think that uh, a nuclear will be part and, uh, of the answer? Mr. Rousa, first. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, I would like to, to say that uh, I fully support what has been presented by Mr. Mayanaga. I think most of the keys 
a great number of keys of in, for your question and for our future is inside the presentation. What is the issue, in fact? The, the issue is that in this world, uh, when we will be something like 9 billion people in 2050, we need to bring to everybody safe, clean, competitive energy. And I would say low carbon energy, because probably one of the biggest issues we have to face is the global warming. As it has been expressed by Mr. Mayanaga, today electricity represents something like 20% of the energy consumed in each country. It can be down to 15, up to 25, depends on the country, but it's quite low. If we want to decarbonize our economies, if we want to, to bring to everybody uh, safe, clean, and competitive energy, we need to first electrify our economy and substitute fossil energy towards uh, electricity to be probably in most countries in the world above 30% of electricity in the total energy consumed before 2050. It's a great, great task. Um, if we want to face this task, of course, we have two natural solutions, I would say renewable, and it depends on the natural resources of each country, of course, water, sun, wind, broom, <laughs> because probably one of the two drawbacks of renewable is, is that it takes place. Uh, the second one is, get, is that uh, apart hydropower, it can be uh, intermittent. And the other solution is nuclear. So uh, I'm sure that if we look at the electricity mix and the energy mix of the countries in 2050, we will have in fact two cases. The first one is renewable and, and, and nuclear, and as much renewable as the country can do. So maybe from time to time it can be 20%, maybe 50, maybe 70, 80%. In some rare cases, such as Norway or, or countries like that, it can be almost 100. But in most countries, 50% would be quite a, a, a great number. And the second part will be brought by nuclear or by gas. I think we have to be simple uh, at this horizon. Uh, this, this are, those are the two, the two possibilities. If you want. Uh, safe, clean, low carbon uh, energy, an energy whose cost doesn't depend uh, on, on exportation, importation, uh, the good solution is nuclear. That's why uh, we, we bet on nuclear. Mm -hmm. uh, France has bet on nuclear since now uh, 40 years, and I'm sure has to bet on this energy for the 50% that won't be brought by, by renewable uh, for its future energy mix that has to represent, as part of electricity, around one-third and not one-fourth one or one-fifth uh, in 30 years. Mm. Mr. Gretrex, on this question of why do we need and will we really need nuclear energy, what is your answer? Uh, well, I'm hoping, uh, yes, it's working, I think, I hope. Um, you will see, <coughs> no, it's gone again. Um, it's going to come back, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yeah, there is uh, an animation. Is it working? Yeah. Um, it hasn't worked. What that animation should show you it will show, yeah. um, is uh, during the course of a year, those are real. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There it's moving. There we go. It's going very fast now. So that is showing you the carbon intensity of the electricity supply in each country in Europe in 2016 over the course of a year. And what you can see from that is the greener bits are where the electricity supply is under the decarbonisation limit, 50 to 100 grams, and the brown and black are the bits that are the furthest over. And you'll see from that that there are a couple of places that are green pretty much all the way through the year. And that's France, uh, Norway, and, uh, and Sweden. Uh, France has quite a lot of nuclear electricity as part of its mix. You'll see also on that that other countries, including the UK, uh, and other European countries that uh, fluctuate a bit between a sort of light brown, yellow, and fleetingly green. And that's where we have, after several years of significant uh, deployment of renewables, a mix of different sources. And that's because the weather changes, mm. and there are some times when we have good windy weather, uh, allied to nuclear means we have uh, a good amount of low carbon power. We have other times when it isn't very windy, and in the last um, during the course of last month, we had a couple of two or three weeks where there was hardly any wind at all. Um, at the moment, we've got a lot of sunny weather, and that means there's some solar power, but it, it changes. 
And then you'll see there are some countries that where it is black and brown and darker brown. And those are the countries that are overly reliant, I would argue, on coal and particularly on lignite in relation to Germany. And countries that don't have that diversity of mix and indeed in the case of Germany have moved, are moving away and despite significant renewable uh, penetration, actually carbon emissions not going down at all and have no chance of meeting their carbon emissions targets. That's my reason for why. And I think while I've been talking, we've almost gone through a whole year and you've seen how that changes. That's the reality of the situation we face. And going back to the initial presentation, absolutely right, this is just about electricity supply. We've got to think about decarbonisation in, in heat and transport and from buildings and all the other mm. aspects as well. So this is the easy bit. The easy bit, there's still a lot to do. And the countries that are able to do it and have proved their ability to do it are those that have got nuclear as part of their mix. Uh, Professor Kepler, and the same, same question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, sometimes it's not so easy because uh, I'm very much in agreement with basically everything that, uh, that has been said before, uh, that uh, sort of the, the strategic orientations must indeed be electrification and decarbonation. That, that's really sort of the, the general framework. Um, as uh, as uh, is appropriate for an economist, let me uh, quickly uh, speak about electricity markets and I think in, in many countries, in many industrialized countries of the OECD, they have been uh, in, a, in, in a rather strange shape. We have uh, very low prices, we have very volatile prices, we have a lot of interventions in nominally deregulated markets, so it's very hard to tell what is really going on. And then we, we have this issue that if you want to decarbonize, we have to invest in low-carbon technologies, nuclear, renewables, hydro. These are always very capital-intensive technologies. So they need long-term frameworks for stable revenue. We don't have those currently in a generalized way. We have them in sort of a haphazard way for some renewables, feed-in tariffs, and so forth. But we don't have a general framework that really allows us to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, plan ahead for the, for the long term. How should sort of a, 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 a balanced, low-carbon uh, system, electricity system look like? And let me come to the, uh, to the I don't know, complementarity, uh, com uh, competition, juxtaposition of uh, renewables and, uh, and uh, nuclear. And of course, nuclear has uh, the, the great advantage of being dispatchable, programmable. In, uh, in, in, in French, uh, we, can, we know when it's producing. It produces reliably 24 hours. And uh, the, the renewables that are, that are sort of the, the options we talk about, which are wind and solar PV, do not. We have this variability and intermittency. Now, on the other hand, let's also say that both uh, wind and solar PV have made great strides in terms of bringing their costs down. Uh, this is undeniable, and nuclear still has to sort of prove that point, and we hope, of course, it can prove that point in the coming years, but this is still to be done. So why do we then, why, why can we be sort of sure that we do need nuclear in that sort of, sort of not very uh, 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 transparent context. And, and I hope the slide sort of gives you, gives you an idea of that. Um, this is a, a, a system with very strongly decarbonized electricity supply, 50 grams of uh, kilowatt hours uh, per kilowatt hour, roughly consistent with the uh, uh, objectives of the Paris Agreement of sort of keeping uh, um, uh, keeping the glo rising global mean temperatures to two degrees. And you can achieve that system uh, either with a lot of nuclear, which is the base case, which is the, the cheapest uh, case in our modelization. Uh, nuclear is in red. Or you can do it with different shares of variable renewables in green. Uh, you have either wind in uh, dark green or uh, solar in uh, solar PV in light green. And you see immediately, these are not costs, but this is uh, gigawatts of installed capacity, which to some extent are a proxy for, for cost. And uh, the more you push renewables into the system, the more, in fact, 
the, the, the total installed capacity goes up and also the costs of the total system will go up because you will need a, um, a flexible backup for the intermittent resources, so total, resource, uh, total uh, system costs go up. And that means sort of having a little bit of renewables in the system, 10, 30 percent, really sort of keeps overall costs roughly in the uh, uh, roughly manageable. But once you go towards 50, 70, 80 percent of variable renewables, costs go up very, very high. And so we know if we really want to de uh, deeply decarbonize, then we will need either you're Norway and you have 100% hydro, you stick with hydro, no problem. But if you're not Norway, then you will need nu nuclear and we'll need it for the long term, we'll need it for deep decarbonation, and uh, we need to plan for it now. Thank uh, you. Okay, thank you very much. Before I come back to the specific issue of cost, Mr. Mianagas, on what has been said, would you have, would you have a remark on what has been said so far? or? Um, or, or I move on to the question on costs. Huh? Yes, I'll yeah, it's working. Yeah, yeah, it's working. Okay. Oh, the yes, uh, I would like to add one thing. Of the I do agree. Oh, what uh, three? Uh, what three gentlemen? Uh, yes, uh, explained and uh, told. The I think the uh, the nuclear is the uh, kind of the utmost and the extreme side of the the gift of the nature and the in, a, uh, in the viewpoint of the, the uh, energy density and others and then the uh, i would like to say the from the ancient time the we utilized the hydropower and some small thermal power and the gas at the coal at first, then coal and the gas with the, some, the help of the uh, engineering and science uh, evolution and the development. And then the uh, nuclear, we have, we reached to the level of the nuclear utilization and still then, and then with another effect of uh, the progress of the science, the we have again found some renewable technology utilization in much higher level. So why don't we utilize and the hold such kind of the uh, new product of the, uh, the science and modern science and technology and the engineering, the renewables and the nuclear? Uh, it's that a good what I uh, yeah. wanted to say. It's a good point, but one question which is a follow-up to what uh, uh, Professor Kepler was saying is that uh, the cost of uh, uh, renewable is going down, while at the same time the impression that we have is that the cost of nuclear is uh, going up. Um, isn't that a major challenge that the nuclear industry has to, to face? I mean, can you really promote an energy solution that we, that might not be cost effective, or do you have the confidence, the, maybe the, the three of you, that the cost competitiveness of the nuclear energy will be uh, will be met? Th this is this is clearly um, a, a very big issue. Um, f first, that's true that uh, if we look at reactors of third generation in comparison with reactors of second generation, and this is not the the way the industry works. <laughs> normally, the third generation is more expensive than the second generation. There's a number of explanations behind that. Uh, of course, uh, we have a, a level of safety and the complexity of the installation which is greater. But moreover, I would say we also have the fact that many of the third generation reactors in the world are first of a kind. And if we want to achieve a competitive new nuclear and a competitive third generation for nuclear, and it's possible, we have to face a number of questions. First, we have to optimize the model. We dealt with a first-of-a-kind model uh, in much of the cases. We can optimize them, we can simplify them, we can understand them, we can simplify a, a part of the documentation behind the components without uh, destroying the safety. And we have a a great uh, part of competitiveness to, to win uh, with that. The second thing is 
we have to look at series effect, fleet, fleet effect. Uh, in France, it was very clear. If we look at the 34 uh, 900 reactor we have uh, in the French fleet, the first one was, was quite expensive. The first one <laughs> was, was very cheap. So we, we have to look at this, at this fleet, fleet effect. The, this is clear. And third, we have to, to think about the way uh, the, the we organize the, the financing uh, of each uh, development. And uh, of course, one question, and this has been said by Dr. Kilplayer, is that the fact that in nuclear, and this is true in, in big renewable power also, we need time. Uh, this is something very difficult in the modern world to imagine project when you, you spend money during 10 years and then you imagine to win money before, between the year 11 and the year 40, I don't know, or 60 maybe. <laughs> uh, this is not really the, the type of investment which is very sexy in this world. So we need regulation to ensure the, and securize the revenue uh, during the uh, operational phase. This is uh, from the year 11 till the, the year 30 or 40. And we need to organize a very safe and efficient uh, financing model during the, the construction. If we put all those elements, uh, I would say, in the cooker, uh, we can have nuclear, which is competitive. This means, I'm sure, we can have nuclear between 60 and 70 euro per megawatt hour. And if you look at uh, an, an equipment, a nuclear reactor, which operates and produces electricity 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, if you look at the fact that it can modulate uh, its power accordingly to the modulation of uh, renewable, if you look at the fact that you can spare investment that would be necessary if you, if you would have a, a 60% renewable electricity mix, if you look at all of that, 60, between 60 and 70, and if you, get, if you have a carbon price, mm. okay, uh, I would say uh, uh, a cost of third generation between 60 and 70, which is possible, is a very good price and probably a good news in each economy in the world. Mr. Gretrex, on this issue of uh, cost and price, we've seen with the, 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 the first new nuclear plant in the UK that the price guaranteed by the government are actually higher than the price Mr. Uh, mentioned by Mr. Ursa. Yeah. How do you position yourself on cost and price issue? Well, for the, for the same reason, it's the first for a generation built in the UK. Um, and so there has to be, you know, that comes with a premium in terms of re-establishing the supply chain and the skills and the infrastructure to be able to do it. But every potential developer of, of follow-on uh, stations in the UK has said they will be lower than that price. And actually, at the time that price was agreed, the cost of offshore wind in terms of a large-scale renewable uh, uh, technology was much, much higher than Hinkley. It's come down. Why has it come down? In that time, you've built more and more. And it's the same thing. The same effect uh, will happen. And it is uh, a challenge, but it's a challenge that I think uh, there's a, 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 a combination of some of the things around finance models and uh, the cost of capital for um, you know for a project where it's very capital intensive for a long period of time before any payback. There are solutions to that. There are different ways of doing that. The UK government has announced in the last couple of weeks that it's exploring different ways of doing that for subsequent projects. Building going on from Hinkley to potentially Sizewell, the same reactor design. EDF in the UK have uh, said how much the cost will come down significantly, more than 20%, just from replicating, because you've got the same uh, supply chain, you don't need to qualify the equipment again. So you can see that effect will, will happen in nuclear as it happens with other technologies. But we have to remember in all of this that what nuclear can deliver you is not the same as what offshore wind can deliver you, which is not the same as what uh, combined gas turbines can deliver you. They all have their part to play in getting to a, uh, uh, an electricity system that is, uh, meets the demands that can be placed on it, increasing demands as, uh, as electrification of transport and then heat happens, uh, but in a way which provides a secure and reliable supply. That meets a range of technologies to deliver that. It's not about one versus the other, it's about how you get the best combination. It's a mix. And Professor, on this issue of pricing and costs? Uh, yes, uh, I'll, I'll start with something that probably doesn't need to be said uh, uh, in front of this audience, I'll say it anyway. 
Uh, we read a lot in the papers about uh, very, very competitive uh, uh, renewable uh, uh, costs. I don't know, 30, 40 uh, dollars per, per megawatt hour. We, we need to keep those in perspective. Uh, we need to keep those in perspective uh, mainly because these, these are very often projects that are rather sort of options that, uh, that will only be undertaken if prices will rise. And uh, in addition, these are, these are projects that are sort of in very, very favorable locations. I don't know, the north of Chile in the Akatamaka uh, desert uh, and, and so forth, where ideal conditions and so forth, which are not replicable in sort of uh, normal, a normal industrialized country. That's the first point. The second point is uh, we need to compare like with like. Um, are, we, are we looking really only for plant level costs? producing electricity? Are we looking for plant level costs producing low carbon electricity? Or are we looking for actually the system value of the technology? And these are big differences. Uh, first of all, it was said, if we want low carbon technology, we need to include a carbon adder. We can't uh, just uh, compare 60, 70 for nuclear against 40, 50 for coal. No, there is a price for carbon uh, for CO2. But the second point comes a little bit back to the slide I showed earlier. Uh, the renewables have what we call system costs, uh, which means you cannot just uh, put the megawatt number, uh, megawatt hour number and compare it. The service to the system is not the same because you will need a more expensive system to accommodate a large share of variable renewables. And that, indeed, that cost goes up with the share of renewables. And with nuclear, you don't need that because you have the stable base load. So as soon as you add the system costs for the renewables, you're at least at 60, 70. And they keep on rising with the share of renewables. As I said earlier, with 10, 30%, you might still get away with it. With 50, 80, you're no longer there. Uh, Mr. Miyanaga, how confident are you that the industrial uh, groups like MHI will be able to uh, reduce the, the, the price of uh, new nuclear? Um, does it make sense to invest in new nuclear or should we more invest in upgrading or maintaining the old nuclear because it would be much less uh, expensive? From my view viewpoint, the, uh, the and also the based on the uh, the current uh, collaboration with uh, the French partners, uh, the EDF and the Framatome, uh, the uh, I I am not convinced the uh, the new uh, the type or the first we decide the because two yes. Uh, change the existing technologies uh, to comply with all the safety, much, much safer regulations, it will cost, uh, yes, probably the in general, the uh, more. Mm -hmm. And the to, yes, uh, secure the long term cost reduction uh, potential. The we had better set some higher level and the ideal uh, technology and the specification together with the operation side and the supplier side. And then the uh, set some level and then the try first the, the a kind of establish the model and then improve. Such kind of improvement is not the uh, a kind of the additional one. It's a, a kind of the new exploration of the uh, much safer and more efficient way. Usually, the uh, of course the the fundamentally some fun fundamentals are of course uh, the inherited, but the uh, we it is much more convenient mm. for us and advantageous. Uh, on the Atmea, Mr. Yosa, are you confident also that uh, you will be able to have a, a on the long run, a cost that will go down quite quickly, or is, are you also will you be facing the same kind of challenges that you face with the the first generation uh, uh, pair? Uh, in, in fact, I think on the Atmea, and this is the the way we work with uh, MHI and, and Framatome, uh, we we have the same work to do than the work we we are doing on the EPR. Uh, we have to take the model. The Atmea is a very good model. Uh, we have to simplify the design. We have to, of course, keep 
I should have said that before, keep the same level of safety, <laughs> simplify the design, industrialize the, the, the design. What does, I, what does I mean with that? If, if we take the, the, an EPR such as Flamanzil Free, Taishan, or, or the Atmea, you have a, number, a great number of references, great re references of on pipes, of valves, of pumps, and so on. And we, we can do a job, which is to, to take all those references, the big catalog of pumps, valves, uh, pipes, and so on, that you find in an Atmea, in an EPR, and try to, to modify the design in a way you have the same function, but instead of having um, maybe something like 1,000 references for one type of uh, for, for valves, 1,000 references for pumps, and so on, you go down to 50, 100 references. You can industrial your process. Uh, you can have much cheaper prices with your suppliers. Uh, this is uh, easier to, to build because if you have only uh, 50 references, you are still uh, you are sure to get the references in your stock. Uh, if you have 100, when you need it and you need to do the erection, you're not sure to have it on your stock. So it's uh, it's easier to, to to build. It's cheaper to build. It's faster to build, and you can you can have a great. Uh, uh, wins uh, in that and much cheaper reactors. When so we, we, we have to do the same work on the Atmea that we are doing in the EPR with the optimized EPR. When, how long will it take to optimize what you say? Is it the, the job for the next 10 years? Or? No, no, it's a m much shorter. It's a, it's a job for 18, between 18 and 24 months. Um, I know it's already complex to build the EPR plus the Atmea, but there's also a debate today among some uh, uh, observer of in this, in, in this industry uh, who said that we might need actually smaller reactors. Um, do we need to maybe include in the mix not only the, the big EPR like the one you have uh, ordered in the UK, uh, but for France, but also for other countries that have, don't have the electricity mix of today that we have in, 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 in France or in the UK, do you think, some of you, that we may need uh, a new kind of uh, uh, reactors that would be a uh, Smaller, maybe uh, as safe as safe, but maybe most uh, cost-effective, Dr. Kepler. I mean, the, there is a uh, there is a big uh, discussion, I think, in the in the whole industry, and and the question is whether, in the long run, uh, small modular reactors or small medium-sized reactors (SMRs) uh, could indeed be more cost-efficient. I think that's the real question. And why, why could a smaller uh, a reactor be cheaper? Well, because some of the components will be smaller, they can be factory built, and then can be just uh, shipped, and that could sort of be huge cost savings. If that happens, and there is a, a prototype currently being built in the United States by New Scale and the, and the, and Nevada, and uh, of course, uh, fingers crossed, uh, we'll, we'll see what comes out and, and, and whether that works and at which cost. However, if small modular reactors will be more expensive per kilowatt than large sized reactors, personally as an economist, I do not see the point of it. Uh, of course, you can always say, well, these reactors, a huge Hinkley point is in the range of, I don't know, 20 billion uh, 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 euros, which is a very, very large sum. If they would be smaller, the large size would be small. I'm not sure. Maybe there are some credit constraints, but these are also very large companies with government support that can mobilize a lot of... So it's really, for me, about the capital costs, what we, uh, was called the overnight costs. And if SMRs can do that, I think they have a role to play. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gretrek, so? I think they do potentially have a role to play. There are some sites, for example, that would be suitable for smaller reactors that aren't suitable for large gigawatt-style reactors. And we go back to the very start of the presentation and rem reminding ourselves of the difference between electricity and energy and, the, dis and the, the way in which more energy is going to be electricity, then I think there's potentially a, a part to play for some of those reactors. And in some parts of the world, there are communities of a size where a micro small reactor would be the best way to be able to get a, a reliable, secure supply of electricity without having very significant carbon emissions, for example, mostly those places at the moment are using diesel to burn diesel to generate their electricity, which is the wrong way of doing it. So there are places where they will have their opportunity. And also there is, uh, with some of those uh, potential small modular reactor designs, there are opportunities for a level of innovation that can help. There are also opportunities for, uh, for more flexibility in being able to ramp up supply to help to address this 
wider issue about how we have that, how we address the variability there is increasingly in our system. So I think there are lots of reasons why uh, SMRs could play a part in the future, and it's not contradictory but complementary to large reactors. Mr. Yorsa, on this point? Yeah, sure, I, I, I agree. Uh, I think, you know, <laughs> there's something uh, special, maybe it's why it's because we are in, uh, in uh, scientists, technicians, etc. It seems we all want to s find one solution. You know, so uh, some people think uh, renewable is the solution. And if you ask, if you ask which renewable, then we, you will have a discussion if it's a solar, uh, hydro, um, wind power, and so on. Something nuclear is the solution. I think there's no one solution. I think the solution is the complement the, the complement of many uh, solution, and and the fact that we need nuclear plus renewable or renewable plus nuclear. And inside nuclear, I'm quite sure that if we work well, in 20 or 30 years, we will have competitive big reactors, and probably part of their competitiveness com coming from a fleet effect, and from the fact that we have models which are big, but if you look inside. There's a modularity uh, in the model, so you can have really industry effect in the way you, you build the component and you, you, you erect the, the, the plant. And we will have uh, SMR. Uh, and I, I, I think we have to follow the two ways. Uh, I'm sure the ID that would come out from the SMR can be useful. Some of the ID could be useful for build characters. And also research we are doing or engineering we are doing on bid reactors will be useful for SMR. So probably the, the, the solution at the end is many renewable from many, many types plus nuclear and nuclear could be big reactors such as the EPR and SMR in regions, as you say, where you need a, a small generation because you, you, you don't have many population. Uh, we will be soon re be running out of time. I have still have some questions. Maybe some questions will be uh, c coming from the audience. They're supposed to appear on the, the, the screen. But I, I have a question for uh, Mr. Gretrex. Um, in this world of uh, energy, um, renewables are cool. Everybody loves um, renewables. Many people don't like nuclear energy. And there is a lot of opponents in many countries when it comes to nuclear energy. Um, how confident are you that the politicians will be able, like maybe you were in your own country, to actually find the solution, the framework, the political agenda to actually include uh, nuclear in, in, in the mix? Mr. Ursa said that there was also a question of uh, uh, return on investment. It's a very long investment that you have to, it's a, it's a bet that you made on a very long time. So. Um, in the world we live in today with uh, a kind of political instability, populism growing up, uh, are you really confident that uh, uh, nuclear will be able to uh, uh, defend its, nuclear energy will be able to defend its point of view? I think it's interesting in, in how you look at it. In the UK context, if you ask people which uh, energy or electricity generation source they most prefer, renewables come top by a long way. Uh, and then comes nuclear. If you ask people in communities where there are proposals to build new facilities, then nuclear comes above renewables. And that's because in those communities where there are proposals to build new nuclear power stations, they are in the UK places that already have a nuclear footprint. So they know the reality of living there as opposed to some of the fears that uh, have been uh, you know, suggested that for people who don't know and people who live close to some renewable projects don't like the visual impact of them. So it depends on how you ask that question. But the interesting statistic from a UK context is if you ask people, should nuclear be part of a mix, then 75% of people consistently over the last 10 years have said that yes, it should, part of the future mix for how you have your electricity. And I think that underlines that the ultimately there is a degree of understanding and we've got to do more you know we've got to have a room full of people who aren't convinced not just a full of a room full of people here who all agree with each other and that's part of what we need to do I think as an industry but there is a uh, you know there's a there's enough I think to build on that people understand that uh, you can't do it all with one source and uh, and you should always be very very wary of people who suggest a single answer to a complex problem on your point about politics and political cycles that energy is a long-term business, you can take decisions that have very, very long-term implications and that have a, a long leading period. Politics is not. 
politics is increasingly short term. You know, the, you want there to be decisions taken on a rational, logical uh, basis. Politics is neither rational nor logical, and it follows emotion and it follows uh, quite often very shrill, short term demands. But I think the most powerful thing that we have been able to do in recent years, and we need to continue to do, is to have uh, an approach which underlines the uh, real risk to the planet and to mankind there is from climate change, that that is something that has to be addressed. That's something which it doesn't matter if you're the politician that makes a decision and you think, well, I'm, I'm not going to be there mm. by the time it comes to fruition. That is such a significant risk for every country and you know, every part of the world that has to be addressed. And I think the climate change legislation, the uh, Paris Accord and all the things that preceded that have helped to get us into a place where actually more than in some other areas, political cycles, despite all the difficulties I touched on just now, understand that you have to make decisions now that have long-term implications for the sake of the planet. And that is a very, very powerful motivator. And we have to keep making sure that's reinforced as, the, you know, as these decisions are taken. A good transition maybe with the, the, the last question. We have less than a minute to try to answer this, and I don't know if uh, maybe Professor uh, Kepler to try to, to answer that, or Mr. Ursa. It's true that uh, nuclear energy is often decided at the local level, but still maybe we need more cooperation at the international level to, to actually make sure that uh, uh, nuclear energy can, can grow. Well, I, I mean, uh, as the, the posing the, the question is to some extent answering it, uh, of course we do. Uh, um, I, I work as an advisor for the Nuclear Energy Agency, uh, so, so this is what we do uh, at, the, at, the, at the daily level. Uh, we have here cooperation between a Japanese and a French company for a reactor. Uh, I think really uh, nowadays the, the nuclear uh, industry is a global industry. And uh, the, the, I mean, uh, perhaps it's not quite that simple because we have uh, still uh, the regulation is still very much national. And uh, that, that is a challenge to sort of, uh, to sort of uh, uh, articulate the, the global nature of the industry with the, uh, na with the national nature of the, of the regulators. And uh, perhaps that is where the international community and uh, international organizations such as ours need to work the hardest in order to sort of get some sort of convergence at the regulatory level. Thank you. But perhaps other okay. stuff. Uh, maybe, Mr. Mianaga, just to, to conclude this, this roundtable, if you have uh, one word of, uh, of uh, conclusion. Thank you very much. The, I, yes, I have been uh, very much uh, the, uh, thrilled uh, uh, to attend this uh, panel. And also, the, yes, I am very much yes, impressed the development of the remarkable de development of the WNE because the, uh, I have been attending th three consecutive times uh, from the first time. And uh, it is uh, yes, my sincere hope uh, that this kind of uh, exposition will be uh, one key yes, promoter to the, the safer and economical and beneficial nuclear industries and nuclear power utilization for all the uh, people in the world. Thank you, Mr. Miyanaga. Thank you to all the panelists and uh, have a great day at the World Nuclear Exhibition. Thank you. Thank you.